Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is cellular adaptations to stress. Now, cells can experience a wide range of stressors. Bronchial epithelium can be exposed to toxins and cigarette smoke. The squamous mucosa of the esophagus can experience low pH due to acid reflux and gastroesophageal reflux disease. And cardiac myocytes may have to pump harder against the increased pressure and hypertension. So there are a variety of ways that cells can adapt to these stressors. And in this short video, I'm going to compare and contrast the four cellular adaptations to stress. These include hypertrophy, hyperplasia, atrophy, and metaplasia. Hypertrophy is increased cell size. Hyperplasia increased cell number. Atrophy is primarily due to decreased cell size, but we can also see decreased cell number. And metaplasia is a replacement of one adult cell type by another. Let's do a deep dive into each of these, beginning with hypertrophy. As I mentioned, hypertrophy is increased cell size, and this is due to increased synthesis of proteins. As you increase your protein synthesis, each cell will become larger. As each cell becomes larger, the organ becomes larger, and we can actually see this grossly. We see hypertrophy in cells that need to respond, but they have a limited cellular capacity for replication. By contrast, hyperplasia occurs in tissues where you can have cellular replication, but hypertrophy and hyperplasia may occur in the same tissue simultaneously. Hypertrophy may be physiologic or pathologic. Physiologic examples include the gravid uterus or the skeletal muscle in weight training in the response to increased resistance. Pathologic hypertrophy is classically exemplified by left ventricular hypertrophy and hypertension. And that brings us to an important point is that hypertrophy may lead to cell injury if the stress is not relieved. Let's begin by looking at an example of physiologic hypertrophy. Here you can see two examples grossly of the uterus. This is the uterus uh, from a reproductive uh, age person uh, and shows the typical size. By contrast, you can see how much larger the gravid uterus is because it needs to uh, accommodate the growing fetus. Now, as a pathologist, I actually find the histology much more dramatic uh, because these two images were taken at the exact same uh, magnification. They are showing uh, the smooth muscle cells of the myometrium. Here we can see how small these spindled cells are, but look how much larger they are. We have this great increase uh, in the uh, cytoplasm in the cell substance. Now, as I mentioned, we can also have pathologic hypertrophy, and here again is our classic example. Here we have the normal myocyte uh, represented in a cartoon, and this is the appearance of a healthy heart with uh, the uh, typical uh, left ventricular thickness and right ventricular thickness. Now, in hypertension, we're going to get adaptation, so the cells will become larger to push with greater force against that higher pressure. And you can see here uh, why this is <laughs> becoming a problem. The wall is massively thickened, and in that thickening, we have shrinking of our chamber. So even though we can push against that pressure, we can't push out very much blood because there's not much in the chamber. In addition, as the cardiac myocytes become hypertrophic, the capillary bed does not expand to accommodate this. Therefore, we have a setup for eventual disaster. Let's look at uh, some microscopic images, again, taken at the same magnification. Here we have our cardiac myocytes, and by comparison, here we have uh, hypertrophic uh, cardiomyocytes. Uh, Let's move to another hyper. This is hyperplasia, which as I already mentioned is due to increased cell number. And it can occur uh, in the same tissue with hypertrophy. And like hypertrophy may be physiologic or pathologic. Now the stimulus for hyperplasia will be growth factors or hormones. And it can be, as I said, physiologic, where we can have uh, hyperplasia due to hormones, such as glandular breast epithelium at puberty, or it may be compensatory. So we can get residual growth of tissue after removal or loss of part of an organ, for example, liver resection. And we can take advantage of this clinically in living donor liver transplants. Now, pathologic examples of hyperplasia are due to excess uh, hormone or growth factor stimulation. Classic examples of this would be endometrial hyperplasia, which is associated with obesity due to peripheral conversion of, of testosterone to uh, estrogen. We also see it in benign prostatic hyperplasia and in warts that are infected by human papillomavirus due to hyperplasia uh, of the uh, epithelium. Now, there are two important uh, concepts about hyperplasia you need to know. 
One is, is that if these signals abate, if we remove those hormones, remove those growth factors, the hyperplasia will resolve. This is in contradistinction to neoplasia, neoplasia which is autonomous growth. Furthermore, hyperplasia can provide a setting for malignancy. An example of this is endometrial carcinoma, which is increased in individuals with endometrial hyperplasia. Let's look at an example here of uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia. This is uh, a section uh, of a gross specimen. Just uh, for reference, a typical prostate would probably be about this big. So this is a much larger uh, prostate. And you can see it's composed of these nodules, uh, which are typically not seen uh, in the uh, healthy prostate. These nodules, which you can appreciate on this uh, histologic hole mount, are composed of uh, nodules of glands. We can also get uh, stromal proliferation as well. Here, the urethra is compressed to a mere slit, seen also here uh, histologically. Uh, and as we look on higher magnification, you can see this hyperplasia of the prostatic epithelium thrown up uh, into folds and heaps. Okay, let's leave our hypers and move to hypo. We don't call it hypotrophy, we call it atrophy. And as I already mentioned, it can be due to decreased cell size as well as decreased cell number. But decreased cell size is a primary con uh, contributor. So the loss uh, of cell, the decreased cell size is due to loss of cell substance due to decreased protein synthesis and increased protein degradation. We can also get decreased cell number through apoptosis if this continues through chronic ischemia or, for example, hormone withdrawal. And atrophy may be, like everything else we've discussed, physiologic or pathologic. So physiologic atrophy occurs uh, in the setting of menopause due to loss of hormone signaling. And pathologic atrophy uh, can occur due to immobilization, due to a fracture. If you've ever had a fractured limb and you remove your cast, you'll find that the muscle is uh, significantly atrophic. This can be seen uh, similarly through denervation because remember the nerve stimulus to that muscle cell is what increases uh, its metabolic activity. And really what atrophy is about is the body's attempt to be very efficient with its resources. If this cell isn't doing very much, why am I feeding it? So when you have decreased metabolic activity, you will decrease uh, protein synthesis. Pathologic atrophy can be seen with diminished blood supply because those downstream cells are not getting as much, they're not signaling, as well as due to pressure. So if you have a tumor in the abdomen, it can press on adjacent tissues, causing them to undergo atrophy. So as I mentioned, decreased metabolic activity leads to decreased protein synthesis. We can also get activation of the ubiquitin proteasome pathway, uh, usually in the setting of pro uh, nutrient deficiency or disuse. This is going to increase protein degradation. Atrophy is also associated with autophagy, which, as you'll recall, happens when a starved cell eats its own organelles in order to survive. So in atrophy, primarily what we're going to see is the cell becoming much smaller, still functional, though with diminished functional capacity. And then if you have continued uh, um, lack of resources through chronic ischemia or hormone withdrawal, some of those cells will undergo apoptosis. So let's look at an example here of atrophy. These are two brain specimens, the one on the left from a young, healthy adult with the uh, normal-sized uh, gyri and sulci. And uh, for comparison, we have an elderly adult where you have widening of the sulci. This is thought to be, uh, be believed due to uh, atherosclerotic uh, decrease in um, blood perfusion of the brain. Now this brings us to my favorite, uh, and I think uh, most important, uh, and most interesting uh, of the adaptations, which is metaplasia. Now, metaplasia is primarily due to stress. Uh, so what happens is you have one adult cell type, which is sensitive to the stress, uh, and then you have uh, that replaced by another type of adult cell, which is more robust. Now, we can also see metaplasia in vitamin A deficiency. This is covered in the environmental pathology chapter in Robbins. It is a smaller component. Much more, we're going to focus on stress. So metaplasia occurs through reprogramming of stem cells. So here are some examples. So you can get ciliated columnar epithelium in the bronchus, undergoing squamous metaplasia in response to toxins in cigarette smoke or due to vitamin A deficiency. In the bladder, we can get uh, squamous metaplasia due to persistent cystitis. So for example, in areas of the world where cystosomiasis is endemic, you can get squamous metaplasia in response to the irritation from those cysts in the bladder. 
Now, you may be thinking, ah, squamous is the way to go. It's the toughest of the epithelia, but it has its weaknesses as well. So, for example, in the esophagus, when we have exposure to acid in gastroesophageal reflux disease, we're going to transition to intestinal-type columnar epithelia, and this is referred to as Barrett esophagus. Now, one of the things to keep in mind is that while you're protecting yourself against that immediate uh, stress, you are setting yourself up for um, a malignant transformation. So we can see squamous dysplasia and squamous carcinoma in the lung in cigarette smokers. We can see uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder in individuals uh, with schistosomiasis. And we can get uh, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus in individuals with Barrett esophagus. Let's take a look at some images. Here we have the cartoon showing the normal columnar epithelium of the bronchus with its cilia. Beautifully shown here in this histologic image, we have our cilia, the terminal bar. Uh, and then we have our area of squamous metaplasia. Now, this is tougher. It may be better able to withstand those toxins, but it loses its cilia. So our mucociliary elevator is now compromised. This has implications for our ability to withstand infection. Now let's take a look at Barrett esophagus. So this is an endoscopic image from the mouth down towards the stomach. And you can see here the normal uh, squamous mucosa. And by contrast, we have the, uh, the intestinal uh, type metaplasia here, the salmon pink appearance of Barrett esophagus. Let's look at this histologically. For comparison, you can see uh, the normal gastroesophageal junction with squamous mucosa uh, and then leading us in here to our typical uh, mucosa. Here we're seeing in Barrett esophagus goblet cells. Uh, this is what we see in the small intestine, uh, not something uh, that we see uh, in the esophagus. And whenever we see that, that lets us know that we've undergone uh, intestinal type metaplasia. Now, as I mentioned, this sets us up for the risk of malignant transformation. And individuals who have uh, Barrett esophagus are followed endoscopically through surveillance with the idea of catching any dysplasia early because uh, you tend to have a worse prognosis once you have moved on to invasive carcinoma. So this is um, a section from an individual who does have dysplasia arising in Barrett esophagus. The cells are uh, large, um, hyperchromatic. Uh, they uh, are rounded up and no longer show nice orientation, and they've lost uh, the ability to make mucin. Uh, and this has actually progressed on into invasive carcinoma, which we can recognize by this uh, desmoplastic reaction, as well as the uh, jagged pointed interface, which is showing our invasive front. As usual, I will finish up with a few questions so you can review the material that you've learned in this video. And as always, thank you very much for your attention. Please follow me on Twitter, and comments down below would be much appreciated. Thank you.